Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to um, our meeting of the Corporate Overview Group. Do we have any apologies for absence? Um, apologies from Councillor Brennan. All right. Um, and any declarations of interest? No. Um, right, we'll move to the minutes of last meeting. Um, if I just go through them page by page and you can indicate if there's anything that you want to say on page one, two, three, four, five. Can you all say whether we agree or we disagree? We all agree. Right, okay. Let me just... There we go. Um, can I just say before we roll on, um, the reports are a lot better. They are more concise. Um, however, we do have rather lengthy appendices um, which the reports run into. And if you're sort of not looking at the top of the page, you think you're still within the report. And um, so I, dis I discussed this with Peter and he suggested we could probably watermark the appendices, appendices pages when they come up. So as you're scrolling through, you then see there's a watermark across it and you realize that you're, you're within the appendix. I think it'd make it easier so that, you know, if, if you are in a hurry and you just want to read the agenda, and the item, you've read it, and you think, oh, right, that's the appendix, right, move on to the next item. I just want it to be made easier for people to, to absorb. Okay, right, um, so we now move on to item four, which I think is a verbal update from Charlotte. Thank you very much, very brief. Um, so the purpose of this section on the agenda is just to give you an opportunity to discuss how the change, as in the change of scrutiny is going, and whether we need to tinker around the edges. So just to remind you that since the last meeting of the Corporate Overview Group, we have had some scrutiny training for all members, about 50% were able to attend. Um, certainly sitting where I was, it was very interactive, everybody got involved. Um, I don't know if you feel there are any particular learning points that you want to take forward. So that perhaps is one thing to discuss. Um, I'm also trying to book the same lady to come back and do some training for cabinet members on scrutiny so that <clears throat> it's the other side of the coin, but that they have an appreciation of what you have all been through um, and that hopefully will help that relationship work a bit smoother. Um, the only other piece of news that I have that hopefully you have picked up on is the scrutiny conference, which is happening here on the 4th of October. Um, I have been able to book eight places, which will be split between those councillors within this room who are able to attend um, and officers who are involved in scrutiny to help give us that balance. So hopefully that should be a, a very beneficial day. Um, Nikki Morgan apparently is coming and Lillian Greenwood. That's correct. Um, so it should be quite an interesting event. Can you put your, your microphone on? Because don't forget we're recording. Sorry. Thank you. In, in that time, um, Nicky Morgan has become a Secretary of State for something, hasn't she? Yes, Secretary of State. I did wonder whether she... Because sometimes they pull out at the last minute, don't they? Well, it's on the I can't says. guarantee, but at the moment she's still coming. Yeah. It's, we, a, it's not something we've organised, but she hasn't been pulled yet. Um, it's, it says on here, she, Secretary of State uh, and Lillian Greenwood, Chair of Transport Select Committee. So it's on there saying that they're coming. So I'm going, um, and I would like to see... Sorry? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> we all might have other things on our minds, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Tip on the 14th. Yeah, we, 
I mean, I don't think any of us know really what's going to happen within the next five or six weeks, do we? So, you know, we just have to carry on as if everything will stay the same. Uh, right. Um, you were asking about how we feel the, the, the process is, is moving forward. Um, we've been having discussions and there are some very meaty items that we feel ought to be scrutinised and we don't feel that we have maybe enough meetings or enough time. I don't know whether any other members want to make a comment. Well, I suppose, Chairman, that is, in making that statement, and obviously recognised from past experience, uh, we need to have some understanding as to what resources are available. Mm, you know, we exactly. could say, right, we want 20 meetings. I mean, I'm just being silly now. We could say we want 20 meetings. Um, well, obviously, that takes up enormous resources. Uh, so, you know, what is reasonable uh, in asking for more meetings and what, what can be achieved within the resources that we have available. Maybe we've sort of got on, on the agenda item five, also we considered scrutiny work programme, yeah. so perhaps we can just understand we'll what the, uh, the yeah. items are When we first. get to that bit. <coughs> okay. Um, so, thank you, Charlotte, for that. Uh, so we'll move on to actually the scrutiny work programme at Agenda 5. Now, we are um, to review the programme. Um, this is the recommendation uh, that we review the work programme for each of the groups and consider the complete scrutiny matrix, including Appendix 3, to decide whether or not the additional item identified should be included in the scrutiny work programme. Um, so... I will open it up. Um, we have had some conversations. Does anyone want to start the ball rolling with their work programme? All right, OK. Programme is, <laughs> is, is actually directed by your work programmes in a sense and therefore we just get rolling items and repeat items so I don't think there's anything that I can add to or say with regard to my work programme. Um, the governance group have had a, had a meeting because otherwise I'd be asking you for reports but we haven't had any meetings other than the governance group. Have you anything to report back Francis? Uh, well it's fairly, I suppose it's fairly easy for us because there's a lot of um, Can you put your microphone on, yeah? <laughs> so, I think I, th I think I'm fairly content with what is on the planned list. We had a very busy meeting uh, a few weeks ago in July um, with the various reports from the internal and external auditors and the statement of accounts. So I think I think at the end of that meeting, people were, were um, you know, pretty much uh, reported out. And the next few meetings, I think it, it's it's pretty much uh, laid out for itself of what we have to do. So I'm quite quite content really with where things are on that. Yes, Peter. Um. Just, just to uh, add, really, the I think it was a quite a positive meeting. The external auditors came back with a positive report on the account, so uh, which is always uh, good news. Um, certainly from our perspective, anyway. Are you trying to move up? No, 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 no. I'm st <laughs> still here. <laughs> um, just a correct one. Correction I want to make is the next meeting is Tuesday the seventeenth, not Thursday the nineteenth. Just to make sure we. Uh, um, 
we do attend them the right day. Right, okay. <laughs> um, and the, the other thing, I, I just had a quick word with Francis beforehand, the risk management report which we've got planned for the 3rd of December, uh, we will be bringing that to the 17th of September meeting. Uh, so bringing it forward. Right, okay. Can I just come back to, on, on one item that we called? It has been suggested, perhaps, that we might consider scrutinising investments and assets, um, which may give people a better understanding and also, um, well, yeah, better understanding of what, what the direction is. And, the risk and that sort of thing so that, that's the only other subject that I would sort of whether that should come to corporate overview or governance it's uh, it's for that is the well two things I'd like to add in relation to that we've got a bit of a sales pitch uh, tomorrow we've got the uh, some training from all in close which will also cover not just the treasury side but there'll be some uh, discussion about the asset investments that the council has uh, which um, we, we actually did report on the outturn position on, on those and some of those investments made at our July meeting under the capital investment outturn. And also, when we present on the 3rd of December, uh, there's a capital investment update that would also incorporate uh, an update position on asset investments as well. So that should actually... Um say whether we are actually delivering on the investments yeah. um, in, in accordance with what our expectations were. Yeah. Right, okay. So um, that probably needs to go then. Right. Um, so thank you, Francis. Um, Growth and Development Scrutiny Group. Uh. Thank you. Well, obviously, as you already identified, we haven't actually met yet. Uh, it's, although it's not on the this little box in the appendix, uh, we are meeting on the 16th of September for a, a little preliminary uh, visit to Abbey Road Depot to try and get a feel of it so that we've got some sense of uh, what the project's about. So that on the 15th of October, my intention is that we go straight in with it because we'll have hopefully done a bit of homework and learnt about it, uh, about the Abbey Road Depot. So it's about, essentially, that's uh, is it going to be delivering what uh, the aspirations of the executive are? Um, SIL, Com Community Infrastructure Levy, uh, again, is that uh, the way it's being constructed, is that going to deliver, although I understand that there may be a chance that it may not have been to full council, and therefore it may be that that, uh, what do you mean? It's on the agenda for full council in September. Right, but I, I believe that they're still waiting for the inspector's report, so it might be a bit difficult if the inspector's report hasn't been received. Well, that's nice you said that the sorry, yeah. local development program, like, we're waiting for the local plan part two, and then the they wanted to do both. Two, we're for the yeah, but the, report, but the but the still report we've got. But the report right. was they wanted both at the same time. That was what was said last night at the development framework group. Well, I think the sill is a, well, uh, the sills for me it's standalone. I, I could go ahead without the local plan part two because uh, uh, we need the sill in place, too sweet because communities are going to be losing out otherwise. Mm. So, uh, in which case, uh, we will be able to scrutinise that. Uh, and then the, the others, uh, well, they, they are what they say they are. And um, it, it's about making sure we are serving business uh, in January, the economic development. Uh, and it's about making sure that, I mean, this does, this is where it cross cuts a little bit because supporting and promoting economic vibrancy in towns and villages, you could argue it involves communities a bit as well. Uh, so, these things are bound to cross-cut a little bit, so we're just going to um, be aware that 
you have to make a choice as to which group is actually going to look at these things. Um, customer service, I think, is what it says it is. And, and similarly with digital transformation, which no doubt we can decide a little bit later. Now, in scrutinizing these particular topics, I would like to see the cabinet members um, brought in to report. Now, do they come to the individual groups or do they come to this group? I would, personally, I, I, would, I would say they, I would like to invite uh, the would cabinet like members to specifically exactly. to come and answer queries, talk about, observe, whatever, um, on, on the actual items as they're discussed. That's what I would like, but I didn't know whether in, in, in our constitution, whether that was acceptable. Yeah, that's absolutely fine, yes. Right. Well, in that event, I think, you need, yes, you need the relevant cabinet members, both for Abbey Road and for... Um, Actually, I think so, it's the same person, I think. Uh, um, but I would think you'll need an officer, for the officer is probably going to be there anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. So... Moving on then to the community scrutiny group, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. So what's not on the uh, agenda as well is on the 27th of September, we've got a briefing uh, about the community partnership review. So basically what we're doing is, since over half our group are new councillors, it was important to explain exactly the history behind Positive Futures and Young so that members are fully up to date and up to speed, especially because our first agenda is going to be quite a... Uh, weighty one in terms of the two items will be quite lengthy we thought right if we make sure instead of spending half that meeting talking about beforehand we can make that all um, go away by having that presentation beforehand and let people ask the questions uh, in an informal setting but that's also been extended to other uh, councils who aren't on the community group, community group as well in case they get a sub at the future point or just want to know a bit about it so that's going to be quite a positive thing in terms of when we go through that in terms of the first meeting so at the moment it's down for the car merchant plan development review uh, and the obviously the community partnership review. So the current management plan is something that we've got to make sure we um, do quite speedily because it's uh, due to go to County Full Council early next year. Uh, at the minute, the plan is sort of in two or three different parts. It's very hard to look at the website, so we want to obviously get a coherent plan to go forward. And since the uh, motion that was put before Council as well, it's important that we have that plan in place in terms of what we can do. So quite looking forward to getting stuck into that and getting um, where we need to be. The partnership review, uh, again, we've got to get that done because it will obviously impact upon the budget, which will work going on there. So, again, the reason we're going to have that uh, presentation so everyone's fully aware they've got a week or so to find out some more information if they want to. Um, and obviously at the presentation as well, we'll have the representatives there from Positive Futures and Young who members can ask questions too. So, again, when we get to the uh, agenda item, we can hopefully have a uh, quite robust discussion and uh, decide where we're going to go from there. And then the 9th of January, in terms of review of community hall facilities, that's something we wanted to have on there, not just for Luttrell Hall, but also, for example, at Walton, where we've got to make sure we've got the community facility in place with the new developments and obviously other developments going on, you know, whether it's RAF Newton, whether it's um, Brown Pastures, you know, uh, and though it's not in West Bridgeford, that could potentially obviously extend towards there, what strategy we decide for West Bridge as a whole. And then the resource and waste strategy is obviously provisional as... Um, Government apparently got to get something else out of the way first, but then they get straight onto the resource and waste strategy. So we look forward to uh, having that all done. And then it's quite a, in terms of what comes on there, is obviously going to influence the next item. So, for example, if let's say we decide to take the funding from Positive Futures and, and, and Young, we obviously have to look at what ways we're going to have to do to engage with people that those programmes would have done originally. So, called that could obviously feature into the March programme and um, other items that are obviously discussed here and uh, put forward by members that we include forthwith. And obviously, we've got the Appendix 4 to discuss uh, at your discretion, obviously, whether that, if that's going to potentially fit into our programme and other items. Is there anything else you want to add, Val? No. no. I, I think, and I have mentioned this, that the item of review of community hall facilities in West Bridgeford needs, you've just said it, it's not just West Bridgeford, is it? it it's the, the halls you've mentioned. I also mentioned community halls across the borough, but obviously the borough don't own those within parishes. So I have asked um, that maybe 
that is put out to the town and parish forum for those other um, halls within the borough. But the ones that you have mentioned, I think, should be incorporated in this review of co community hall facilities, not just West Bridgeford. And absolutely, Chair, that's why I think if we cover the West Bridgeford first, then that's what's going to give us quite a, a steer in terms of the developments. So obviously, I hope that can then feed into the work that Neil's group will be doing around um, the SIL and potentially the Section 106 to sort of look at how we can sort of work, work that into there as well. So if we do West Bridgeford first, we know it's quite topical, should we say, at least especially with um, the uh, potentially the outcome of the marketing study on Glutter Hall uh, coming out next year that we sort of obviously yeah. head that one off, then hopefully then we can get an item on the further agenda to discuss the other facilities. Yep. Okay. Right. Sorry, so, sorry can I um, oh, sorry. just put a, a challenge in, really, in terms of what's, what's, the ob what's the objective of looking at the other halls? I mean, obviously, the West Bridgeford ones are focused on because they're within the council's control. Mm -hmm. Just want to be clear what you're trying to achieve if you start looking at the other halls. Yeah, I mean, I could say personally about town parish ones, I don't think that comes under our remit as, as, as so, because obviously that's controlled by town parish. I think it's the looking at all the communities, have they got the right community facilities? Because obviously we can't just rely on the fact that town and parish councils are doing uh, their own facilities because obviously we've still got that uh, duty to make sure there are proper community facilities there. So I think it's important for us. For example, Ed Walton is a key example. That's not covered by a parish or town council yet. Obviously the community facilities there are sufficiently lacking, especially in the new development. And so I think it's important that we are reviewing, although you could say that comes in West Bridge Ed Walton, people would uh, disagree with that because it's, Ed Walton's its own, uh, its own uh, kingdom. So uh, I think it's also, it's, it's important, like I say, we don't just expect town and parish to have their facilities because a lot of West Harrison, uh, sorry, town and parish councils might just have a hall, which obviously that's not just that. Do we have the right community facilities for children, parks and NPL? So I think it's something that we need to look at Broad over. That's my personal view, anyway. And something that will take the when we have the meeting in in January, we'll um, perhaps get the steer address the committee and see whether they want to look at that item in uh, a wider scope. Yeah. Just add on to that as well. Just one other point is who's using what facilities as well. So as we mentioned, um, there's a number of towns, parishes using particular communities halls, etc. But they might be using other ones um, to get a good understanding across the board. Everyone's using everything, mm -hmm. so you're getting the value. Can that fit into the matrix? Well, I think um, I think Jonathan summed it up nice in that obviously the focus is going to be West Bridge to start with, and then yes. I think the scope, if, if there's a, a, a widening of the scope or a change, if you like, that should be decided by the, the group. Right, so long as we're aware of it. Right, so we've actually gone through the the programs as we have laid out here at the moment but we also have to consider if there are any other topics um, that we feel should be um, considered um, and as always I have uh, a list as long as my arm um, but I think uh, maybe I will Councillor Clark's itching to press the buttons <laughs> just pressed it uh, thanks, Chairman. I think uh, because uh, we ha we're looking at community infrastructure levy, and uh, Jonathan did actually uh, mention the phrase briefly, um, I think we should look at Section 106 uh, contributions in and the aspect to look at how are they developed, how are they drawn up, how are they negotiated with the developers because I anecdotally have evidence that there seems to be grey areas and uncertainty as to people get agreements and say oh yes well it's in the section 106 agreement but then when you actually delve into it uh, oh well yeah well we think that can be delivered and oh well yeah, well that's what was asked for well how is it asked for how is it developed how is it negotiated is it delivering, are the things that are in the legal agreement, are they delivering the aspirations of the council and of that community that uh, we hope they are? Um, for instance, just as an example, obviously I don't want to get into too much detail, but just so you try and understand what I'm getting at, uh, there are, in new developments, there are school, uh, contributions for schools 
And so the developer said, right, well, we're not building the school, but here's a shitload of money to contribute towards it. Well, how was it negotiated? Because who's actually going to deliver the school? Who's actually going to stump up the rest of the money? Uh, well, that's up to somebody else to do. So who's there's no guarantee that the school's actually going to get delivered. Who's decided how much that school's going to cost to build? Well, that's a good question to ask. Yes, but how, how is that figure arrived at? That's the, so it's all about the process of how are they developed, how are they negotiated, and are they asking the, for the right things? Mm. Right, okay. Um, I also felt, and this will cross over 106, that we should be um, scrutinising um, the proposals and development for Fairham. And the other one that I feel ought to be looked at uh, because it's we're heading off down this road is the Bingham Growth Programme. Is it actually going to deliver on people's expectations? Um, so those are uh, fairly um, imminent events that we really need to be looking at. So, the other one, so which is... Oh, sorry, you're sorry. Left. Sorry. Yeah. Um, obviously, on the, on, well, both of those have got separate groups in any case, in terms of how they're developing. Right. Um, so, so yeah, when we started out talking about scrutiny, we did say there are other vehicles and the other methods. Right. That, and we've got to be mindful of resources uh, where we've got. So, obviously, the, the idea of the scrutiny process now is that we focus on specific topics. Obviously, we've got the programme as it is, and we've just got to be careful. I suppose a duplication of resources, given that these other these other groups, certainly for the Bingham Growth, when you say the Bingham Growth Programme, obviously the, there's a member group for the Bingham uh, Leisure Project. Um, the Fairham Pastures is going to have it's going to have a growth board. So there are some other vehicles, and we've just got to be mindful of, of right. we've got finite levels of resources. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. and we've already got a programme as it is, so. Um, can, can I just interject there, but surely what we're trying to challenge is, is that, for instance, is that growth board actually delivering what the council wants it to deliver? It's all very well having you know, a member group to develop something, but is it actually, we're, we're just there, as, if you like, as a cross check, that it is actually looking at and developing the right things. Okay. Hmm. So we should call them in. Yeah, yeah, which is, and you're right to raise that as a point. Obviously, there are early days on both at the moment, so it might yeah. be something that's it's in our sort of longer list of things to look at. It's just on the basis that prevention is better than cure. There's no Absolutely. point. Absolutely. You know, if in three years or five years or whatever it is, it all went belly up. Oh, well, let's find out why it went belly up. Far better to check that it's been developed in the first place, like the health service, better to prevent a disease rather than spend the yeah. five times as much money curing the disease. So we've already got an issue, haven't we, at Ed Walton? Yeah, yeah I wasn't, I wasn't Where, suggesting you know, five years' time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, if we could call those... Pull the, that down the, on the, well, yeah. well, I suppose okay. what we need to do is put it through the matrix in terms yeah. of the... Uh, yeah, That's what's exactly. the first port of call. Um, and one which is quite close to my heart... Um, I think we should be scrutinising the planning process and procedure. I would like to say enforcement, um, but that has been through PMB recently, so I don't know whether it can be incorporated into um, our scrutiny. I scrutinised it a number of years ago and 
some of the things that were supposedly going to be actioned and implemented don't seem to me to be. So, um, or if they are, they're not um, consistent. So, um, if we can we look well. at that. So, with all of those, these, we'll put them through the matrix and obviously I'll speak with other executive managers yeah. as well. Right. And I think it was either Jonathan or Francis had... Uh, it's Francis. Um, yes, I thought that um, we have an extremely successful community events programme, particularly particularly around Central Avenue, which some, some of us get fairly jealous of. <laughs> um, and I know they, the, the, the team work extremely hard. But it has been commented to me that, um, you know, does Rushcliffe have uh, a vision of community events around the borough? And are there are there aspects that we can learn elsewhere from the success of of our community events, mainly in Westbridge Road, and things like that? So I think I think that perhaps deserves a, perhaps a bit of scrutiny, really. I don't know if scrutiny is the right word, but you know what I mean. I mean, it's whether that forms, because one of the also one of the topics on the growth and development scrutiny group is support and promoting economic vibrancy in towns and villages, and clearly that what we all talked about is linked to that. So you could argue that is part could be part of the scope of that particular review. I, I, well, personally, I see it more as a community thing. I don't see it as a growth and development. Thing. I don't think it's growth and development. Are you talking more about actual across. events that take place, like street market? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm new to this, so bear with me because I'm trying to get my head around what scrutiny actually is. Because what you we're still working it out. Well, but kind of what I'm understanding from what the way you guys are talking is, it more sounds to me like almost like quality assurance. Like we're just checking the quality of the provision that we're offering. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that's what scrutiny is. My, imp my impression of scrutiny was kind of like analysing the decisions of cabinet and council and checking that, checking that those kind of checks and balances were even... I don't, I, because if it sounds to me like we've got these groups in place, they're kind of doing the quality assurance bit then is that just reinventing the wheel? We're just kind of doing the same thing that's already been done in another room. Well, are, are there aspects of council and cabinet that you feel should be scrutinised? Certainly, yeah. So. Yes. Say so. Yeah. Well, yours. Well, there's one thing that I mentioned. I'm just kind of finding my way, and I've, yeah. I personally feel like we need to look at pensions, the investment of pensions. That was one I was going to bring up with... And I'm aware that they're through the county. So how can we influence pensions? We can't have been through that one. <laughs> well, I haven't been through that You one. weren't, no, you weren't here then. <laughs> so any kind of scrutiny along those lines would be welcome. But yeah, that was kind you, of my you first have, one. You, you need to present the topic that you're actually suggesting. I understand, yeah. That needs yeah, scrutinizing. Yeah, yeah. How do I present that then? As, as we have just presented... So like, we, yeah. yeah, so I feel like I've presented that yeah. now as a possible time, but I'm saying that I'm still finding my feet with it because I realise it's not necessarily a burden. I mean, I've spoken to you just briefly about it today, but that was kind of something I thought I'd come in with and I'm trying to work it out. So I realised it didn't really fit in this particular arena. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, it's if, if, if people got ideas, as we've talked about some of the ideas now, it's for them to work through the, the matrix in terms mm -hmm. of where does it sit and, and obviously then I'm going to have some more dialogue uh, with yeah. yourself in particular uh, as, to, uh, as, to, as to how we take them forward. Uh, but I will reiterate the point, obviously, we've only, we do open, going back to what Neil said in the previous item, we can't have 20 meetings of every group. <laughs> and uh, and we, we, only have, we, we do need to focus on what's important. And it's where some of the things, I'm not saying they're not valid, uh, you know, the, the, 
perfectly valid things to consider or look at is sort of which whether the scrutiny issues or the looked at in a different forum and and if they are scrutiny issues where we put them in the program they're the, the key issues yeah. that we need to decide yeah so don't don't be afraid to come forward with oh, items no, that you think <laughs> think you would like to see scrutinized and We'll discuss it oh, and even go through the yeah, matrix. We'll, we'll add as well. You know, obviously, you know, if you want to speak to officers, whether it be myself or Charlotte, just to you know talk through things, and obviously we'll talk through them anyway and, and give our suggestions. That's the best way forward. But having said all that, we're all actually new to mm. the process that we're undergoing this through process. the corporate overview group. This is a whole new process. Mm. We've been on scrutiny panels, but this is a whole new process. Right. Um, Can I just add, add something? Oh, yes. Yeah. Maybe I'm going out too much on a limb here, left field. Have we had three cabinet meetings cancelled because of lack of agenda items this year so far? I think we have. I thought there's been two is it three i think we i think we've cancelled three or i may have had one in my head expecting it to be cancelled like august or whatever there is no scheduled meeting in august yeah so yeah I can't hear what you're thinking yeah i don't know without checking the point anyway the point i was making is that you know if capacity is an issue is capacity an issue because you know um Suppose when we don't have subjects to discuss at cabinet, they're probably uh, cancelled at a fairly late stage. But you know there are opportunities for us to have additional meetings of scrutiny groups, which um, which may have important issues to discuss. May only be one issue. Would you like to call the leader in to discuss that with him? <laughs> I think I think it should. I just raise it. I mean, I mean, there may be just on this year where if just trying to think why if there were cabinet meetings cancelled, it might may have been around the time for example when we had local elections and things like that. In which case, the staffing resource would have been tied yeah, yeah. up with local elections and not necessarily focusing on. Quite well, obviously, wasn't there a few last year? Well, I think I think. Can we make some inquiries as to, yeah, uh, and, and report that back? Because if that is, is the case, and, and it's because there is um, there's nothing to discuss, well, that's capacity that can be used elsewhere. In fact, we, we appear to have cancelled four meetings. Four? Since September last year, since last year, four, since the last 12 months, four months. Well, yes, I think we need to look into that. Thank you. I think we should look into that. Now, one thing I did just want to mention, and it's an old chestnut, isn't it? Ed Walton Golf Club. Where are we at with Ed Walton Golf Club? And should we be scrutinising it further? Because is it actually providing... Um, what we would like um, or is there a prospect for doing something else with Ed Walton Golf Club? Yeah, sure. I know on the next item we we'll, we'll discuss it because apparently there's a report going to Cabinet later this year but um, whether that has to go to because I've got to be honest I would like to review that under my group mm. because I think that facility is um, I think severely so. mismanaged I've also that all along even when I was on representative on that committee and I think um, like I say we do need to manage that especially like I say because from my understanding we're not making any income from that anymore mm. uh, and it's such a large piece of land that should be provided not about housing or value or anything else but community value which um, 
we're not getting exactly. Them. Yeah, without sorry, without sorry, Chair, I'll just uh, right. no, uh, without wishing to uh, preempt what's in that report. Um, clearly, there's going to be a report to cabinet before the end of this calendar year, and it may be obviously from that report. Obviously, that you would be more informed then as to how to proceed. Right. Okay. As long as we flag that up. Um, right. On Appendix 4, there is the topic, the review of the Public Space Protection Order. Now, when I was on community development, we scrutinised this. Um, and there's a proposal that it should come back to us to be scrutinised. My personal feeling is that it hasn't been used, it hasn't been necessary to use it, and therefore as it hasn't been used, is it not a waste of resources to review it at this stage? Would it not be better for us to send it direct to Cabinet um, and review it should we have to use it but obviously it has to be reviewed every three years. I don't know what everybody feels about that. I mean, the chair, I did have a conversation with Dave Banks who um, did feel that it needed to be reviewed um, and, and scrutinised this way. We sort of indicated we'd go on to our agenda in October, uh, which I think was the current plan before it goes to Cabinet. I agree with you. I mean, if there's nothing to scrutinise, we don't want to scrutinise it for scrutiny's sake. I do know it's got to go, got to be re-adopted by March 2020. Um, so whether there's enough time to say we scrutinised in January, they went to Cabinet in February, whether that's too tight to turn around to give a bit more time, if that helps to say, do we get a bit more information back, uh, which would help that process. But like I say, if not used it, so that's a, a good thing, uh, because there was all the bad press before, and was that we were going to, you know, uh, persecute anyone or loitering that uh, shouldn't be, but we've obviously not done that. But um, it, I do know it's quite a topical subject at the moment out there, so we've, and there's been a lot of press over councils who have, implemented these and uh, been bad press. Oh, so have had to. Yeah, and I, and I had to. So uh, I do know from conversation I did, they actually did want to consider it. happy to do it. I mean, my personal view is I'd probably prefer January if I was to scrutinise it under our agenda because we've got two quite big items on for October, so we don't want to do it as a simple add-on. Uh, but it depends how that works in with the programme of uh, the matrix, as uh, it likes to be called. Magic matrix. Yeah, I, th I think, I think <laughs> it's, it's earlier because the intention is it's approved by full council prior to the 1st of March 2020. And the council, there's, there's a council in March, but it's not the 1st of March, it's after then. So I think you'd be missing that deadline. That's why it's mm. been put in at the time. That's why it's been, yes, I appreciate that. You wanted to say something, Charlotte? That's exactly what oh, I was Oh, that's what you wanted to say. <laughs> but how does... Council Walker. Does everyone, does every council have one of these? Or is it's not a mandatory thing to have? It can be it just... So what stage did the borough decide this was necessary? Uh, it was brought in about three years ago um, in relation because it was made available by the government as a tool, and we felt with the... Uh, rather than uh, dealing with issues potentially ad hocly, was worth bringing in that policy, as I recall, just to make sure it was all tied up and to be properly scrutinised, managed, and to give the police the correct powers. Because I think mean, a lot of issues were at the time the police weren't sure how to quite deal with things. So that order sort of gave them protection, for want of a better word. Into, did, the into police, their did they ask us to do this? Or ask the borough for this? It wasn't on the committee today, but I do remember they were very positive about us doing it from the report and the briefing. It gave them some, another. Not something else in their armoury is it worth they never had to use it yeah is it is worth checking with them to see if it's just a waste of time or they're happy with us to continue having one because of course it gives them more clout more powers to be able to move people on when they're causing a disturbance so they're happy that we've got it they're supportive of us continuing to have it those discussions have already taken place thank you but we're all very civilised in Russia, so <laughs> haven't actually had to use it. Um, and therefore, like, like I say, do we really need to scrutinise it at this stage? Just a separate question. So, just, um, are there any, uh, I know we've got one line of data here that there's been no fixed penalty notices issued. Um, is there any other information that's been provided by the police on any aspects of this? 
other than that. I think if Mr Banks was here, he'd probably be able to provide you with more information about where they have needed to use the... the it's not just about the fixed penalty notice as a final point of call, but of course there's lots of points leading up to that that they have used in the past and that people have then moved on or gone about their own business without them having to issue the notice. Dave would be able to give you those inf yeah. that information. I can't. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I remember I was at that meeting. I might have been substituting uh, mm -hmm. for that particular one. Um, and I do recall vaguely that... Um, there were issues that uh, had been flagged up involving children, basically, um, and concerns from parents. So it was, at, at the time, if I recall, we might have been getting an overflow from Nottingham City, who I think were taking proactive action. I suppose we were getting an overspill or whatever. But I remember at the time it was, I'm not saying it was an emergency or a crisis, but it was clearly something we had to have in our toolkit that we were encouraged very much to proceed with. It went hand in hand with the homelessness, rough sleepers, um, and I think it was identified that in point of fact there were only three at the time in, in uh, Rushcliffe, uh, two of whom did not want we offered assistance, we do offer assistance, and two of whom did not want to be homed. That was their wish. Yeah, but I think from the discussion we've had, I think uh, is, let's put it on our agenda, I think, for September, because it's not going to be a long item by the sounds of it with the production there. I think if it's to make sure that we are where we need to be, it's going to be quite a short one by the sounds of it. If we need to just make sure we're, we're tied it off, especially with the comments done about creating it safe. So I think... Um, from the yeah. from some of the comments around the room and uh, the indication of my vice chair as well, if we we're happy to add it to our work program for the twenty seventh and to put it through that, unless someone comes back from offices to say in the meantime that potentially we don't need to do it, so then we can go to court to to cabinet. So put that caveat in there. We're happy to we take up a lot of officer resources. So are we agreed then that that it actually does go for scrutiny? Right, so we agree that it will go to scrutiny then. Um, so I think we've, unless anybody else has anything else they want to discuss with regard to uh, the work programme, I think we've given that a fair going over. Uh, right, um, Oh, we've done item six, haven't we? So we're now to item seven, which is finance and performance monitoring. Um, and I think that's probably over to you. Well, quick introduction before I pass on the baton to my colleagues. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so obviously this is a... We've tried to do it in a new uh, format as best we can, trying to... Uh, Get the pages Something else down. new as well. Yeah, trying to get the pages down, and I know we've had a separate discussion about how we can improve it further for, for next time. Um, so obviously it's a qu first quarter report. Sarah's going to pick up the financial aspects, and then and Charlotte will talk through the performance elements, and, uh, and obviously open to questions. Um, so this is the uh, report of the first quarter of this year. Um, things will develop throughout the year and um, th there will be additional variances that will move. So the position is at the 30th of June and um, overall on revenue we're projecting a £285,000 underspend, which you'll see from Appendix A on page 22. Appendix B on page 23 shows the detail of these variances one of which is the reduction in the management fee at Edwalton Golf Course, which we've previously mentioned. Um, this is more of an offset by the favourable variances resulting from additional planning income and treasury investment income due to slippage in the capital programme. The capital position is shown in Appendix C on page 24, and it's anticipated that we will have an underspend of uh, 15.326 million, and the detail of this is shown on Appendix D on page 25. 
Um, this results mostly from uh, the previously mentioned slippage relating mostly to the crematorium, um, Bingham Hub and Cockgrave, <coughs> and um, some schemes that are no longer going ahead, such as Fairham and the depot redevelopment. The asset investment strategy currently also has one million uncommitted. So overall, it's a positive position, but it's an early stage in the year, so things can move um, and change overall by the end of the year. So for Charlotte. Thank you. So the second half of this report looks at performance, so it's always a good idea to have finance first, so that you've got performance in context. Um, what's changed this time round is obviously item nine on your agenda is the new corporate strategy, which you saw a draft of last time round. Um, what we've done is rather than bring you quarter one performance monitoring the same way we did last year and then change it next time round because there's a new corporate strategy, we've preempted the corporate strategy and developed two new scorecards. The idea being that we can use the first scorecard to look at the corporate strategy, both the tasks involved and the measures that are there to look at the impact of those tasks being achieved. So that's what we called our corporate scorecard. And the second one then is the operational scorecard, which looks at, is the council actually delivering what our residents need it to? So these two are presented in the report with further information in the appendix. Um, just for ease, the corporate scorecard currently has 17 tasks, none of which have started because we've not actually adopted the corporate strategy yet. But the measures that we're already um, collecting um, 12 are performing well, and I've identified three as exceptions in this report. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about those. And then in the operational scorecard, we've got 21, perform uh, 21 indicators performing in line with their targets and previous performance, and seven indicators that have been highlighted as exceptions. So it's really up to you to, to discuss now what you want to do with that information moving forward whether you think that the officer comments that have been included in the report there are sufficient for you to say, actually, officers got this under control for a moment, but we'll keep an eye on it and see how things are going at the next quarterly report, which will be December, or whether at this stage you think that, actually, this seems to be spinning out of control and we want to get a handle on what it is that's going wrong, in which case it would then go against the scrutiny matrix and we'd call it in for having a look at at that point. Does everybody understand the scorecards? No. <laughs> That's not no. Laura's got a handout. I don't. No. I have um, to say, I didn't understand them either. So, what we have um, within the organisation is a piece of software that they call a performance monitoring system. So, um, managers across the council put tasks, risks, performance information into a system that then my team looks at corporately and collectively. I think we might need a few over here, if you don't mind. Hang on a second, they come round this way as well. Um, that system flags up um, performance variances. So what we're looking at is at the beginning of the year, um, a manager will set a target for a certain element of their performance within their team. And what the system will do is flag up whether it is between 1 and 5% within that variance. So if it's over 5% of the target, it flags it up as a red bubble. Exit image. If it's between 1 and 5%, it will flag it up as orange, i.e. amber. You might want to have a look at this. There's something not quite right. If it's between one, if it's, under, if it's within 1% or it's performing on target, then it's a green bubble with a tick or green triangle. Sorry, say that again. If it's if it's performing where we think it is, if everything's on target, oh, it's a there. green bubble and a green tick. So what it should mean that when you glance down the appendices, what you will see is one of these little symbols next to each of those indicators. So at a glance, when you're just looking at a big ream of information, you should be able to see which ones are flagging up on the system as being concerning. Now, what my officers will then do is go and speak to those individual managers and say, look, what's going on? Why is this red? Now, sometimes there's a very good explanation. Um, sometimes they kind of look at you and go, don't I? In which case we ask them to go away and reconsider. 
Um, but the idea is, is that then they should be able to explain, because at the end of the day, this is management information. They should be using these performance indicators and task progress bars basically to manage their services. So what hopefully I would then be able to bring to you is an explanation of why performance is showing as red or amber and what the officers are doing to make sure that that doesn't continue, that they bring it round or just admitting that actually it's out of their control and this is the reason why it's off, off target. And I asked you if we could not have that, have this as an extended yes. form, which then shows us what the issue is, what the action is. So what we've got at the moment is the explanation of why something is red is in the actual body of the report. Yeah. <coughs> And what Councillor Cumberlack has asked us to do, and what we'll do next time we produce this report, is include that, replicate that information in the appendices alongside the, the lots of different figures that you can currently see. I suppose the only other one to, to uh, take into account at the bottom of that slide there is, is the trend line. Now, the trend arrow does stump people. So what you've got in front of you is information that looks at the, the quarter of the year that we're looking at. So current year current reporting quarter against the target for that quarter. What the trend is doing is looking at information that you don't have on this piece of paper and comparing that against the same set of time last year, the same time period the year before and the same time period the year before that to give you a trend analysis of whether or not overall that's improving. And what the team have done is included some examples on that sheet for you which will hopefully explain that and show you that actually you can be a red bubble or a, blue, or a green bubble and still have an up and down arrow. And it's not just about the information that's provided to you on the sheet that you're looking at, but we're looking at much more in-depth information. Now, Councillor Clark will remember that we did use to provide an awful lot more information. And you just get totally and utterly blinded by the number of figures. So in order to save your sanity, we've taken those out. And our officers will actually go crazy in the background, but point out to you where things are going awry. Yep. And I think that was much better when we've got the extended form that was brilliant. Um, but what I, I would like to see, obviously we can't do it at the moment, because um, this, is, this is looking at this now with hindsight. Um, the next time you produce these performance indicators for us, I think for other people reading these documents, this explanation needs to be with it. It was in the old copy of the report, but we were trying to be brief. <laughs> we were trying to keep down the report. So but what I was this is an do, appendix. Oh, no, no. This is an appendix. We can pop it in the appendix if you like, or we can yes. pop it on the extranet where all members can see it. What would people... What prefer. do you think is what most useful? What would you useful? prefer, that it goes on the extranet or that it appears within the appendix each time? That's one comment. I think this is great. Um, to answer your question first, I think it would be good just to have this as a quick summary glance if you want more information in the appendix. It's in the appendix. I, I just feel that we aren't the only people who read this. Uh, it, it, it's a public document and uh, the public may look at it and think, what the heck's all that about? Um, so putting it on the extranet isn't going to help the public, is it? So I think it needs to be within the appendix. Of course. You could have a link on the report that goes to the London Park Extra. Yeah. Yes, that would be that would be useful. Very good. May okay. I ask a question? Yes. Um, all these performance indicators, who decided those, or when were they decided? It's an interesting question. Ooh. So, this particular group of indicators, which we have now brought together and called the corporate scorecard or the operational scorecard have been worked on over the last three or four months by my team. But actually, the indicators themselves have probably been in existence for some of them for the last 20 years. So have they been reviewed over the past 
They regularly get reviewed on an annual basis to decide whether or not they're still giving us information that we need. And my team data quality check every single indicator <coughs> on an annual rolling program to make sure that the explanations that we use for how the data is calculated actually match up to what people are doing. Okay, come to me two questions mm -hmm. in addition to that. So for me, the one thing I just quickly noticed was um, combined number of social media followers. It's just a number there. I know it's increasing, but it doesn't mean anything. No, oh, it's just for context. Okay. Um, and the other one was, uh, once again, it's a trend graph. You've got a number of new homes built, but no data available so far this quarter. That's right. Some of our indicators, that one in particular, um, some of the waste indicators as well, because they are calculated in a different way, it takes a while after the end of the quarter for the data to be available. So some of them come in later. So you might get quarter one data for that indicator at quarter two, for example. Right. So right. it's not that we've missed it or anything like that. It's just not available at this moment Is in it time. worth putting an asterisk and saying that? We can certainly do that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, it would be helpful, actually, when just for future reference, really, when we talk about the indicators or anything, if we can reference the page you're talking about. So yes. Everyone Absolutely. Sorry, that was page 33, the social media one, the first box. Councillor Clark. Uh, just uh, Appendix G on page 36. Um, well, actually, before I refer to that, it was just a slightly tongue-in-cheek question because um, we're talking about sort of red, amber and green. Um, what if uh, a target, say, has been exceeded by double the amount? Um, you know, it's a, it's a double green, but uh, do, do, we need, around the table, do we need to be asking, well, what, why, why did that occur? Well, yes. Um, we we should just ask uh, raise the bar for the target, I would suggest. Right? Yeah, yes. Um, which sort of almost backs up the question as to who, who set the uh, target in the first place. Um, so more serious on appendix G, the, the three top red traffic lights there. Uh, is that something that we should be concerned about? Is that something that could be included within the planning process? Question. That's exactly what I was going to say. If this is this is feeding into what we've asked for, is it not? Um, and presumably when we see these red indicators it may be that we look at this and think this is an item we should be scrutinizing that is exactly the idea yes so that is absolutely we're already yeah. ahead of the game there yeah just well just to add as well though just because obviously we haven't got that uh, description next to it but mm. on page 19 that does give you a bit more explanation as to what the, uh, where the issues is. are and I'm afraid the other thing I will add is if you look at the corporate scorecard and there are some indicators there that talk about our big strategic sites, the ones that are really going to make a difference in the borough, the performance on those is actually very high and well above target. Now they're a lot more complex and take much longer, but it's about the, the, the um, planning growth manager balancing the resources that he's got to make sure that we're hitting targets in the key areas, as you have already said this evening more than once, the fulfilling the, the aspirations of the executive, i.e. that growth agenda and making sure that we can get houses built. So it's you've got to look at the, the bigger picture. The bigger picture, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. Right, so have, oh, Chair, which just says the, if on page 29, for example, the capital monitoring programme, we're obviously invested some money into West Park Junior Car Pavilion and West Park in general. Considering the fact that we're going to be reviewing these facilities in the January meeting, is it worth seeing if we can push back that spend as far as possible? Because, for example, if we decide to um, close down a mothball, whatever, Junior Car Pavilion, for example, and we, but we just spent like 40k on, um, or, uh, sorry, on on toilets and bar refurbishment, uh, which has been signed. I'm just conscious about putting that, putting that cost in fact, if we then decide to do any action with some of these facilities that we're just throwing money in there. Pete's going to tell me there's a very important reason why we're doing it. Well, normally it's a lot, a lot of the tend to be sort of health and safety yeah. related reasons that we yeah. will do some of the spend that we feel yeah. can be delayed, we will yeah. defer. So, 
have we thoroughly discussed that? Are we happy? Is everybody happy with where they are? Oh, sorry. I'm not sure if this is the right, but can I ask questions about the actual report? Are we still on the scorecards? Yeah. yeah. Can I just get some clarification on the, the transition to universal credit in 4.1? I don't know the page number. Thank you. Um, I just I just didn't understand that, so I just wonder if you could put that into context for me. Kind of, what does it mean? What was the extra funding to support the reform? And just kind of, it says something about money saved, and I just, because obviously I'm new, I don't understand the context of that particular paragraph. So the, the government, when they introduce legislation, they give us extra funding. Uh, when you the transition. Yeah, and so it's known as Section 31 grant, we, in this terminology, so largely we are self-financing now, but on, obviously when they introduce some legislation that requires some costs that the authorities incur, then we get some specific funding to enable us to deliver that transition. And that cost was used up in the staffing of making that transition into the new system? Well, yeah, it's either staffing or it could be some software changes or, or that type of thing. Thank you. And then you, you touched on your report, the management fee. I didn't understand what that was in the end. Is it the golf course? Is it the, I didn't understand what that was. Yeah, we've got an income that we receive from, um, I think it's Lex, yeah. now that pay for the, the golf course management fee. And currently we've agreed to waive that fee for this year. So that's income that isn't coming in, was the idea. And why, do you know, why was it waived this year? What was the thinking behind that? Basically, because the, the, they've got operational difficulties in managing the contract at the moment. Is the golf course under our... So it's ours. What's well, one of ours? Yeah. And so how does the LEX fit into it then? Is that the Lex. management company that manages it? Yeah, LEX run the golf course. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Oh, all right. It's on. Oh. <laughs> Right, okay, so um, I think we've uh, covered the uh, recommendations on that topic uh, and we now move on to item eight, uh, customer feedback and your report, who is, that's you. <laughs> um, just before I talk about the report, I thought it would be worth spending just a few minutes to explain what the council's customer feedback system is to provide you with some context if you haven't seen one of these reports before and you don't know what happens when people want to give us some feedback. So we, we call it customer feedback because it does actually encompass complaints, compliments that people want to pay us and any kind of comments that they might have about the service that they've received. So what it really is about is opening a channel of communication. What we tend to focus on in this report is the complaints that people make, because at the end of the day, these are the things that we want to put right. It's very nice to receive compliments, but it's well known that actually you, you never get somebody saying, oh, blimey, thank you for emptying my bin every week. However, if we miss their bin once, they're on the phone. So what we tend to have is we've got... Um, an, an open policy whereby people can give us any kind of customer feedback via email, a good old-fashioned letter, we do still get those, um, on a special form that we provide with some space for them to write it, or an online form on the website. The majority of them these days do come on online, either via email or uh, on the online complaints form. We do occasionally make an allowance and talk to people over the phone. Now, I say make an allowance um, because it's actually very difficult to take down somebody's complaint over the phone. We do encourage them to write it down if they possibly can, but obviously from a, an equality and diversity point of view, you couldn't counteract or you couldn't count out um, having people give that to you. I've also sat down with people and I've written their complaints down if they tell me what they are in person. Um, what we've got is a two-stage process so complaints come in via whatever format and they are investigated by the lead specialist the team manager for whatever service they respond to so a planning complaint uh, would be responded to by the lead specialist for that area he has 10 days to investigate it 
and get back to the person. So we send an acknowledgement, we tell them when they're expecting a response, it's investigated and they send a letter or an email back to tell them what's happened. Um, if the complainant is not happy with that response, i.e. their complaint, they're not satisfied, it hasn't been resolved, they can escalate it up and somebody at Pete's level, an executive manager, would have a look at that again with me as a corporate complaints officer um, and we would have a look at it and say, was the complaint well investigated? Has it been responded to well? Have all the points been addressed? Um, is there anything else that we could do? Again, sometimes those go out within the 10 days. However, sometimes they can be very, very complex, but we always keep the customer informed of how long it's going to take us to investigate those. If people still aren't satisfied at that point, they've, in, they've exhausted our complaint system, they do have the grounds that they can go then to the local government ombudsman, an independent body who will investigate their complaint for them. We have to provide the ombudsman with all of the information that we have. They ask a, a big bunch of questions. We provide them with information. They obviously talk to the complainant as well, and they make an independent decision on whether or not the council should be held to account or not. So this report covers all of that. Now, I would say there's also a lower level of complaint, grumble, service request that we don't classify as complaints. So if somebody emails us, messages us over social media and say, you've missed my bin, I'm not going to classify that as a complaint. I'm going to get on the phone to the depot and ask them to go and pick the bin up. It's just been missed. However, if that person says, you've missed my bin three times this month, then I want to be knowing why. So it's about taking that into account and making a judgment on where things sit within the system. So this report, which comes to this group, previously came to Performance Management Board on an annual basis, just looks at the customer feedback that we've had over the last 12 months. So just to go through a, a few key points, 51 complaints were received by the council at stage one of the last 12 months. Um, I think nine of those went up to the second stage. Um, consistency is good, um, response times are very strong, and generally people are quite satisfied. It's always very difficult to judge whether people are satisfied with their complaint on the basis that they don't tell us that they're, they're happy that their complaint has been resolved or not. Um, there's also some information in a paragraph. Oh, um, hang on, 4.5, about the complaints that were investigated by the local government ombudsman. I'm very pleased to say that actually we have the lowest level across the whole of Nottinghamshire, which was quite nice to achieve this year. So none of our complaints were upheld by the ombudsman. Um, I'm quite happy to answer any questions about the complaints or the information in the appendices, which just points out where those complaints fall within the council. The one thing that I want to ask, and it's not about actually about how well we're doing now, it's why was there such a big spike in between uh, 2010 and 12? because we ought to know what that was, because we don't want to repeat it. It's very simple. I did go away and have a look. If you take the graph back over previous years, it, it wasn't a spike, it was a general trend up till that point. And what are we doing better then? What we're doing better is we have changed the process of dealing with complaints and they've moved within the council in terms of who responds to them and who manages the process. So it was a change of how they were done and how they were managed, which streamlined the process. Great, good. So, so that's, yes. So it's good management and it's improvement and obviously we're not going to be making those mistakes again then. One would hope not. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's positive, that's lovely. Councillor Wheeler. Thank you, Chair. I mean, first of all, we should say, um, we should pass that back to everyone involved, it's well done for the, uh, the fact that where our complaints is, especially in race to other local authorities. I think the second best one I can see on there. And Melton, always a very amenable bunch of Melton. I know had a store down there. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a, a very good result that so should be passed back. Just a quick one around social media. So I've noticed, I noticed on Wednesday, for example, that a um, resident in my ward put a complaint on there about Tone Pier Point and a, a comment on there saying, oh, it's County Council land. And they've come back and argued and said, well, it is, but our, our BC logo is everywhere. There's not a response from there. So 
Would that go down as a complaint? Because someone's complained, we responded back, but then there's no other communication. So either I assume we contact them directly by meshing them or, or, or what have you. But will that, does that count or do we say only if it goes on the forms? If uh, we tend to st classify the stuff that comes through on social media in that service request kind of category in the asthma that sits underneath the complaints process, mainly because they tend to be very, very specific, very short term, very easy to fix things. So what we do is we take those conversations offline, as you've said, we use a direct message, we get in touch with people via the phone or online, depending on what their preference is, and we actually deal with those straight away because they tend to be, oh, you've missed my bin and we can fix that. Um, it tends to be a misunderstanding about information or they're asking us to fix something that, again, is, is within the remit of the county council. Where there is a much bigger issue underlying the very one line statement that they've put on social media because we've taken that offline and we can get more information from them if it looked like actually there was an issue there that needed investigating we would actually call them up get that information from them and then process it through our normal complaints process one thing just maybe to go back to the communication team on when we've responded back so for example if you remember public reading that it looks like we ignore the complaint which we haven't i'm okay. sure but most companies will put a response like we have um, sent you a direct message, something like that, so members of the public know that that's happened. So that's great. Yeah, no problem. Oh, you wanted to go? Yeah, uh, just a couple of points really. I know Tina focused on that spike, but if you look at those numbers, I mean, obviously, don't want to go to those relatively high numbers given the numbers of transactions and services the council deals with. They are very low numbers. And one thing Charlotte didn't mention, which I will. Yes, we do get compliments, and there's some a table of compliments in there as well. Not quite as many as the complaints, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, needless to say, I don't think any have come from Neil. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, yes, I I think we are a uh, good performing council and uh, I'd be very surprised if we had got vast numbers of complaints. Um, so I think um, we've dealt with that then and we will move on to uh, agenda item nine which is the corporate strategy. Now um, we did look at this um, last time, the last meeting we had and um, we asked for some amendments to be made, which uh, I think have been made. Have been made. Um, so I would now ask if everyone is satisfied with the uh, strategy. Councillor Clark. Uh, we've got, just got one query, really. Uh, hang on. The page that's uh, the introduction from the leader and chief exec, um, for the two photographs, which has got the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, priorities. Bearing in mind this is a document that is hopefully live for four years, so in theory, whilst we're reading this now, we might be reading it in three years' time and it's still relevant. If you go down to um, the third last bullet point committed to playing our part in delivering housing growth it's got there in a sentence it says nearly 3,000 have already been built well in three years time if you're reading this mm. that's going to be irrelevant isn't it yeah. uh, so I would have thought it's better not to have time related statements I know there are um, descriptions in the other parts which is which is fine because that's contextual and introductory, introductory, but as a priority, anything that's time related becomes outdated. Well, we do have the, also we have the trail, the journey, don't we? Which, if you're then going to read that in um, 2021, the journey at, at this point has stopped in 2018. Well, it's actually telling a, that is telling a story, though, isn't it? It's saying our it journey is, yeah. since 2016 up till now. So how how we've got here, and then the corporate strategy is how we're going to progress from 
from there on, isn't it? So I would have thought that's fair enough. It, it's just where you've got, as I say, if in three years' time somebody's reading this, what, nearly 3,000 are being built? Well, they're going to say, you're supposed to be building 13,000, not 3,000. <coughs> That's difficult, isn't it? I mean, um, at the beginning, do we have a date? Yes, 2019, 2023. Because you could then say the same thing about, um, as well as achieving all this, did you know that in the last year? I think whatever you do, this type of document is representative of a space in time the moment that you write yeah. it the day that you publish it is when all the information contained in it is current three weeks down the line we know something happens mm. and all of a sudden you want to be desperately either taking something out or putting something back in and that's why this time round we've, we've made a, a really conscious decision to call this a living strategy so Things are changing very, very quickly now. They didn't change this fast 20 years ago. You could sit there 20 years ago and you could plan the next four years and you would be reasonably confident that you would deliver that over that four-year period. These days, things change much, much quicker. So the idea with this document and the action plan that's appended to it is that it will evolve. And whether we make a conscious effort to review it every year and update it every year, or we review it at a half year point, at a sort of a biannual point, so in two years' time, whether just accept that this is where it is now, and actually the action plan changes on an evolving basis as we go through the whole four year period. I don't think really we should get tied up on one figure being in the introduction that's that's correct on the day that we go to print. Not that we're printing it, publishing it. What would the process be for re reviewing it as we go along? And I'm, again, conscious that's, that's opposite time and it's... Um... This group is looking at how we're performing against the tasks and the measures in the action plan on a quarterly basis. I think if you got to a point where you said, actually, we've done 50% of the stuff in there, what, what else is going on? And you know that there's other stuff that's happening outside the corporate strategy that perhaps needs to be incorporated, then we need to sit down and talk about a mechanism for doing that. Now, it may well be that Cabinet looks at that, or it may well be that the recommendations come from this group up to Cabinet. But that's a decision, a discussion that we need to have well, internally. Shouldn't we therefore have a structure which says at some point we review it, we look at it? We are. We look at it every quarter. That's what the performance report that we've just looked at right. is doing. Okay. So, fine. So, what you're saying is that every quarter we would then have the opportunity of saying that maybe we should be doing something just, about it. You know, just as a suggest, suggestion, Chair, and this is if we can do this, is it worth just um, date stamping the version of the strategy and then it's clear that's yeah. the point that it was about published? Mm. That would, that would be a good idea. What do you think, Councillor Clark? You're already switched on. I'm, uh, I'm not convinced by what I've just heard. This is just the one exception where it's a specific figure is mentioned at a date and time, which, by your own admission, is now probably pretty much out of date yeah, already. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's just... Because these are the the priorities, aren't they? Yeah. These are the corporate priorities, and it's already out of date. So, I, because it is mentioned in the um, later uh, new homes, sorry, no page numbers. So, uh, where it, it's got the photographs across the top of the page and new homes, it's mentioned again there anyway, which is fair enough that it's mentioned there because that's more of a contextual description whereas this page is the actual corporate priorities. Well, can we not put in where we've got nearly 3,000 have already been built? Could we not put in as at and put a date? Yeah. 
if you note from the recommendation of this report, this is about you saying, Corporate Overview Group are happy with this document, mm. but we would like you to consider mm. adding this yes. statement in so that when it gets discussed at Cabinet yes. next week, yes, yes. Next week, um, then that can be put forward yeah. and then they will be able to make a decision actually, do they want officers to amend that then before it goes to Council um, later in the month, which I think is the following week. Yeah. So if we suggest... I think that should be a recommendation. Yeah. Well, either we, that it's taken out or we put as at 2019, nearly 3,000 had already been delivered. So we, that gives Cabinet a choice. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, is there a list of the changes? When we reviewed it last time, there's a number of changes that need to be made. Have you got a list of those changes? Or are they documented anywhere? They have been done. They have been done. We have made lots of changes. But no, I haven't got a list of the changes because it was a lot of it was proofreading and grammatical stuff yeah. that we have changed, the context of the words. The main change is the introduction of the, the environment um, priority towards the end and the extra part of the action plan. At okay. my briefing, I went through it. Okay, there's only one small thing that I noticed that I thought we'd changed, but ah. we can pick it up later if you wish. Oh, no. Okay, okay, it was on page 50. It says, Councillor Simon Robinson elected as leader, bringing new vision and drive. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, was that was to be shortened as Councillor Simon Robinson elected as leader. On the journey map here, page fifty. Page fifty. Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, on the our journey since twenty sixteen. Right, and which which one was it? So straight after twenty seventeen. Yep. You've got planning peer challenge, and on the left hand side you've got yep. Councillor Simon Robinson. Who's that box? That was the point. Of Oh, no, it's not. Planning peer channel. Yes, it is. That's the right way around. No, I think so, it was so, no, the so comment more than the it's the type there, wasn't it? What are you saying? So, it's so the box, new that says, and drive. there you go. Did we alter that? I can't remember doing it, but yeah, I can't. My understanding that in the previous draft, the, the line and the box were in the wrong place, which we've now corrected. That's what I thought. OK. I thought it was, the, yeah. I don't, don't think we altered the wording in the boxes. No, we've, they were in the wrong places. Okay. Did I see somebody else indicate on? Yeah, Councillor. I just wanted to congratulate everyone on the addition of the environment to it. I think that was great and well done. Right, so are we happy that this then goes to Cabinet, but with those that recommendation that either that wording about the 3,000 homes is removed or that we insert, that they insert as at 2019. Yeah, so we're all happy with that. Very good. Sorry, Chair, just one of the quick, quick questions. Was it going to be version controlled as well, you said? Well, I, I suggested we date stamp it at this version, so obviously if we change it again, then you'd have an, another yes. date on it. <laughs> That's great. Um, right, so I think that brings us to the end of the meeting, unless anybody has anything else they wish to, to add before we finish. Oh, Councillor Clark. Only just very briefly, when we were, I meant to mention it, I forgot, when we were talking about um, other things, maybe you, Chairman, could ask, if you haven't already done so, maybe you've already done it, ask the leader or the executive is there anything they want us to scrutinise? I'm hoping that they will give me feedback. I have asked that. 
and that's exactly what I'm, I'm I, I've, I've already asked him to do just that. Ms Walker. Um, I'm curious as to what, what's been done, you know, when we had that scrutiny um, training and we wrote on the big yep. sheets. So what's kind of the progress with those things that were written? Are we going to look at those as a group? Or what you was mean the, the spidergraphs? That... No, we wrote on big sugar paper on the walls. Oh, right, yes, yes. That is a very good point, Councillor Walker. What happened to those? They were all typed up and sent out. Couldn't be absolutely certain which combination of all of you they were sent to. I think they were sent to everybody, but that's just kind of made me think maybe they weren't. I don't remember I seeing it, but it's not been on the... We'll look into it tomorrow and work out what's happened. They were definitely typed up and circulated, but I'm not quite sure who to. Right, okay. And there was one thing I forgot to mention. On the finance report, exactly, in 5.4, it said properly insulated. Sorry. <laughs> I just didn't know what that meant. What is properly, what, at what stage are we considering ourselves to be properly insulated? Like, is there, do you have a figure in mind with that statement? Where, where does that... It's a financial well, report. I haven't gone back. I just looked through my notes I think, again. I think it's... Um, it's just an interesting way of phrasing. Yeah, it's and just, I just... It's normally when it fits a bit. So I'm just close to me, yeah. No, I caught you off <laughs> guard. Thing, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a lot of it, essentially. Uh, yeah, so I'm, just for everyone, for clarity for everyone, paragraph 5.4. So whenever we um, obviously talk about risks, there's a relationship between our risks and our reserves. And what we need to, what when we've done the budget workshops and the councillors here will testify to it, we do make, uh, the, the council now increasingly is facing more and more risk and therefore we have to have, ensure we've got sufficient reserves to protect ourselves, so hence the word insulated against. I suppose what I'm asking risks. is what, who determines what that number is or uh, how is it well as i'm the council section 151 officer yeah, so, so you make we a set, judgment on that I'd make a judgment and but it's approved by this report that goes to full council when we set the budget we'll which uh, it, if you like, gives re reasons and rationale behind uh, uh, the reserve levels thank you Councillor you want to come come back to this uh, journey page can I ask I mean if if we see fit and I can see the big picture if we see fit to put in electric car charging points at Wishka, where are they? is it in 2019 oh yeah top there. of the road yeah. there is it not reasonable to mark the fact that our chief executive retired. I mean, not an insignificant person. We also we have um, Kath Marriott, obviously with Simon Robinson in the introduction. But I mean, it's almost like you know. I mean, we've been on a journey. It says here, journey since 2016. Our Chief Exec retiring was a pretty big, you know, a big deal. A, a guy who put so much into, you know, the organisation. It's it's almost like, you know, you, he's rubbed out, isn't he? Oh am, I, am I being a bit too... I'm not sure that I think that has anything to do with the population. What we have on that journey is what affects the community mm -hmm. and um, our democratic representatives. I'm not sure that the internal workings are appropriate to that. Okay. That, that, that somebody else. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. But I do feel that your point is valid in the context of the Simon Robinson being the new leader. If you're going to have that bit in, then why not have the chief executive bit in? Mm. Like why? Sorry, if you're going, if you're going to have the with bit about Simon Robinson starting as leader in the roadmap, but he, which doesn't really. I mean, he's the elect. He's elected by. 
he's part of the elected um, council. Yeah. yeah, but I see your point that if you have that fit in, why then wouldn't you have the chief executive's retirement who's in as well? I think, I think my challenge would be for what purpose, because yeah. obviously yeah. the fact that Simon's been included is, you know, there's some comment as to why he's been included to mm -hmm. do with the vision and you know, direction. The fact that you know, obviously Alan Graham did a great job for the council, but we still the journey just is continuing. You know, it's, um, I'm not sure it was it okay. was anything material yeah. to the document. Councillor Clark. Yeah, I think um, it's a very moot point because I think you can probably sort of go either way, but I, I tend to favour along uh, the lines of uh, Mr. Linfield's um, comment because the leader is more policy aspiration driven um, and the chief exec is delivering that policy so basically the way the structure works is the leader decides the policy with his colleagues council colleagues and then charges the chief executive with, right this is the policy of the council you deliver it um, I mean I, I accept totally the mm, yeah. um, I'm not yeah. decrying the point I'm just trying to suggest that there is that slight distinction of a, a policy uh, and the um, priorities of the council which is then delivered by the officers the chief exec is a civil servant and therefore I'm not I don't really think that you should be marking that on a a council community document, mm. public document. Okay. Are you wanting to say something else, Francis? You've got your light on. Okay. All right. Right, so um, we're recommending the document to Cabinet as is with those. Um, suggested alterations and that brings the meeting to a close at uh, 8.35 is it or thereabouts I was just going to say, having said all that, it's not to say that, you know, we don't think he did a wonderful job. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. no yeah. Well, I did yeah. say good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost felt like saying, well, the king is dead long with the king. Life goes on. Exactly. And, and, you know, the man in the street, it doesn't, no. that's not the part that, that affects the man in the street. The leader yeah. is right. a member of a party yeah. for which you have a choice yeah. to elect him or not. Well, they got all the they didn't they got all the of full council. So. Yeah. And to be fair, Alan, Alan doesn't see that sort of thing. Sorry? That's not in his nature to see that. 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 In his nature to see that.